we'll probably have a few more people jumping on the call. Um, my name is Sarah Wilson. I'm the executive director of the St. Joseph's Museums. I'm also the current president of the Missouri Association of Museums and Archives. We are excited to have you all join us uh, in doing this webinar series since we've been quarantined during the pandemic. Um, usually on Wednesdays, we've been doing um, kind of educational programming, and then Fridays, we've been doing colleague conversations. So we appreciate um, you guys being a part of our audience and, and learning with us and adapting with us as we go through these very interesting times. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Amber Clifford Napoleon, who is the uh, director of the McClure Archives um, in Warrensburg, Missouri, and she is going to present to us today about uh, pests and pants and holes and hats and um, how to look for uh, creepy crawly things in textiles. So Amber, thank you so much for joining us. Amber's a board member of MAMA. Um, and I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, hi everybody. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm gonna screen share here in a minute so that I can go through slides and show you fun pictures. Uh, while that's on, if you have questions and I can't see you waving, just type them over in chat because I'm keeping an eye on that too. Okay, so let me share my slides here. Okay, pants in the pants and holes in the hats. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about integrated pest management today and what that is. Uh, and then how to do that in a fairly simple, uh, affordable way. I'm always thinking about budget, as are we all. So how to manage IPM in an easy way, and then focusing specifically on pests that are textile problems, and some of them you may, not, may know, and some of those pests, I imagine you're going to go, that's a pest for textiles, I had no idea. So. We're going to look at the at the top six, the top six multiple offenders, so that you can keep an eye out for them. I'll talk a little bit about how to find them and a little bit about how to treat them easily if you do find them. Uh, and then I've got some resources for you at the end too, okay? So to start out, IPM or Integrated Pest Management is this holistic way of managing pests and that includes mice and things like that, although I don't talk very much about mice today, I'm focused on bugs. Uh, but it's really a way of managing your pests in the collection, knowing you kind of accept that they're there and then try to decrease the damage and alleviate the problem rather than assuming they're not there. Uh, because in IPM, if you assume pests are not there, that means you're not looking for them. Uh, and you want to assume that they are there and be looking for them all the time. There's really sort of three parts to IPM that any employee can manage. And I want to make sure you all understand that my work study undergraduate manages my IPM. Uh, so any employee can be taught to manage IPM because it is not work intensive. It's just detailed. Uh, so please do keep that in mind. This is not something that those of us who are already doing 42 jobs need necessarily to take on. So there's basically three steps in IPM for textiles and for other collections. The first one is mitigation, which means checking, isolating, treating textiles before they're put in collections. Sorry about the typo there. It's like inspection and quarantine. At this point, we're all pretty accustomed to quarantine. So um, mitigation is that, the idea that you're going to really check things carefully before you bring them into your collection uh, and assume that they have pests and work from that position. Uh, the second one is identification to make sure you know what to look for, for pests? Can you identify them at the egg, at the larval, and at the adult stage? And can you prevent them from spreading? Uh, and the last one is treatment. And really, unless you know absolutely what you're doing, you should avoid most treatments. If you've got a major infestation, then you need to call a specialist. Uh, but if I am going to talk to you about a treatment that's easy to do if you find pests on an isolated piece that you need to deal with or you get a, something that's donated that you know is buggy um, and what to do about it in the short term. So I'm gonna talk about just that level of treatment, something everybody can do, okay? So the trick to this is that mitigation and identification and treatment all work together. You're doing all of these at the same time. They aren't like separate steps in a plan where you do one and do the next. All three are happening all at the same time. 
So the key to successful IPN in textiles then is that you mitigate, identify, and treat before you put them in collections. And I know that for most of us, that's not gonna happen because we're worried about pests that are in the collection now, right? Uh, but in the future, if you think from this IPM perspective, then you check everything much more carefully. You monitor everything much more carefully and you can start there and start a monitoring program for your collections as they are now. Uh, and if you just start assuming that your textiles have a pest problem and work from that, uh, you'll get ahead of the game much, much more quickly than you do if you assume that they're clean. Um, you got to inspect textiles carefully, identify and remove pests, encapsulate and freeze infested textiles, and I'm going to talk about that later, uh, and then return them to the collections clean, uh, and we'll talk about the steps for that. And then you always want to maintain a record of any issue you've had. So if you've had something that's buggy, Chances are that it's going, chances are it's going to get infested again. It's just going to. Um, or chances are it's spread to nearby items and you just don't know that because it's in the egg stage and the eggs are microscopic. Uh, so you always want to keep notes on what the problem children were uh, so that you can go back and sort of keep a closer eye on it and surrounding textiles just to make sure you don't have a spread because that's what we want to avoid above all. I will tell you that one of the jobs that I had, I was a, an assistant in ethnographic collections at Texas Tech, uh, and we had a major infestation of carpet beetles in a collection of Kashkai rugs. Uh, and it was a major infestation that required a year of cleaning collections areas and a year of freezing rugs and treating them. Um, that's what you want to stay away from at all costs. So what I'm going to talk about today are some ways to sort of mitigate that, treat things before you get them into collections, and then hopefully give you some tips about how to find things on collections now uh, so that you can stop that kind of rapid spread. Because collections storage is like the perfect place for insects to spread. So these are the most common textile pests, carpet beetles, and I'm going to talk about those, clothes moths, cockroaches, which most people don't think of as a textile problem. Most people think of that, if you're in the museum and archives business, people who have paper worry about cockroaches. Uh, but that's a, a big textile problem too. Crickets, which everybody just thinks are cute, is a textile problem. Uh, silverfish and, and their sort of companion species, fire brats, and then termites. And everybody assumes that termites eat wood when really termites eat anything cellulosic. Uh, and that's going to include cotton and linen and anything with starch. So these are the, the big six that you want to watch out for. I'm going to assume that you know how to identify a cockroach and that you know how to identify a cricket today. Um, I'm going to assume that you know largely how to identify a termite. You want to think about an ant, but sort of golden in color. In Missouri, we have flying termites as well. So an ant with long translucent wings. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time on the ones that are much smaller and much harder to identify. That's carpet beetles, clothes moths, and there's a couple of kinds of those, and then silverfish and fire brats. Okay. All right, so we want to think about pests getting attracted to two types of food uh, because that's what they're doing. They're eating for food. Um, and so I've divided them into pests who are attracted to proteins and pests that are attracted to starches. So proteins is going to include wool, mohair, anything with feathers, anything with fur, anything that's got leather or hide, whether that leather is finished or not does not matter. Uh, and then anything with a protein-based stain. If somebody in 1890 was wearing that shirt and dripped their steak on it, then you have a protein-based stain. Even if you can't see it, it's still going to be there microscopically and the bugs can find it better than you can. Uh, another protein-based stain you want to think about is human sweat, uh, which is protein-based. So underarms, collars, waistbands, the insides of hats and shoes uh, tend to have a lot of protein-based, even if they're microscopic, protein-based deposits. And that's what these insects are going for. So we're going to talk about three, webbing clothes moths, case. Now, case sometimes case moths get called case. Sometimes they get called 
casing moths. Sometimes they get called case making moths. These are all the same thing, all the same. If it has case in it, it's the same thing. Uh, and then carpet beetles. And there are three kinds of carpet beetles, black, variegated, and common. All that really has to do with is what they, what their, their shell looks like. They're all about the same with one caveat, and that is that black carpet beetles can be as small as 3 36 of an inch. They can be very, very small, and they are jet black. Uh, so it's very easy to mistake them um, as some other kind of deposit. I had a 1920s flappers dress covered in jet bead, uh, and when we really inspected it, a couple of those jet beads weren't jet beads. They were, carp they were carpet beetles, black carpet beetles that had hitched a ride. Uh, so you really have to watch out for that. They had eaten up uh, a sweat stain in one of the armpits of this jet beaded dress, and they were on there, and they looked just like little jet beads, but they obviously weren't. So let's look at some pictures. Okay, so up here you see this is a clothes moth adult. Okay. Webbing moths and case-making moths look about the same. They're white, largely. Um, they're slightly larger than a pantry moth. For those of you that have seen pantry moths, they're slightly larger than that. Um, this is what webbing larva looks like. It looks kind of like a kid would draw a caterpillar. Uh, and then case-making larva looks more like this. Uh, and I can tell you, web-making larva, when you find it on a, on a collections piece, it's going to look like a spider web at the larval stage uh, because what they do is they create this larva and then they create this sort of web around themselves. That's why they're called webbing. Um, and it is easily mistaken for a spider web. It is easily mistaken for a piece of dust or a piece of lint. So you want to check your collections and you any piece of lint, you need to get tweezers and remove uh, and make sure that it's not something else. And then down here, these are the carpet beetles. Varied or variegated just means that the top of the beetle is sort of a mottled black and white and brown, a sort of basset houndy, right, on the back. Uh, and black carpet beetles, you can see they're a little more compact, and they are shiny black beetles. Um, at the young adult stage, they are very small and a little rounder, and as they get older, they get a little more elongated. But again, these are hard, shiny beetles, okay? So let's look at some of the damages they can do. This is carpet beetle work. Uh, so you can see this is called grazing, where they've just sort of eaten an area but not cut a hole. Uh, they can also cut holes like this. Um, but you will, if it's a carpet beetle, you'll see this sort of area of grazing around the hole where they've been sort of, oh, the good stuff's right here, the good stuff, and then they zero in on the really good stuff. Uh, so you can see here the same thing where they're sort of eating around it. And then these are casings. They're going to look like tunnels normally. Carpet beetle casings look like tunnels. If you look down at this photograph down on the bottom, this gray one. Nope, sorry. You can see what looks like these little tunnels. That's the same thing, just to, on a different kind of textile. Okay. These down here in the red pictures, this is right here, this is a case-making moth. Uh, it's sort of blown up a little bit, so you can see them, but not a whole lot. Case-making moths can range up to eh, three quarters of an inch, I would say, something like that. On colorful textiles, they're fairly easy to find, and they are pretty, because they're case-making, that means they make this little, this little case where the larva is included. Um, these are the cases, and they look like little uh, you know, little tiny white capsules. Um, the kind of damage they do is over here on this other photograph where you can see they've just eaten up holes and they've eaten up tracks. The, these moths tend to eat as groups. They tend to congregate. Carpet beetles tend to work alone. Moths tend to congregate. And then all of this, this is what's left of the sweater. This is called frass. Uh, that's what the bugs digest, essentially, it's what moths digest. Uh, that is your textile in powder form, uh, and that's what you're going to end up with. So you can see up here uh, in the top right corner, this is a wool flag, a U.S. wool flag, and you can see all this damage caused by moths. 
some serious, serious damage caused by moths. Looking at the holes in the tracks, I'm guessing case making moths. Um, and then down here, you can see this is a, a Persian rug from the Kashkai, a collection that I had worked on. Uh, and you can see all of these little moth casings. Now, I want to say just a couple of things about treating these before we go on. So the only really good way to make sure that you don't have these things is to inspect your textiles and remove them with tweezers. Um, if you try to remove them with your hand, you just pick them out with your fingers, you run the risk of um, spreading them or squeezing them or anything like that. You don't want to do that. And you want to get anything that's around them too. So as I said, those webbing larvae, they tend to have this larval stage where it looks like there's a spider web or a piece of lint and, and you might see the larva in there, but it's going to look like, like a little speck of something, right? It can be that small. Uh, so what I recommend is that you check all of the tight spaces of a textile, especially. So hems, collars, buttonholes, seam lines, um, anywhere that there's something has been stitched together, you wanna, if you can, check on both sides of the stitch. Uh, and then anywhere where there is a sweat stain, um, hats are terrible for having especially carpet beetles. Um, shoes are terrible for getting this kind of thing. And then anything, quite frankly, anything military, anything that's been worn in military service, it has been sweated on and spilled on and drugged through the mud and whatever else, and then probably stored in a dark place for 50 years. Uh, and that is perfect, perfect moth environment. Uh, so what I recommend is that you check every corner, that you look at that textile like you're looking for a microscopic bug because you are. Um, the one thing that I don't recommend is vacuuming. And I've heard different people say, you know, oh, if you have a moth infestation, just vacuum it up. Well, you're essentially just then creating another problem, and that is moths in your vacuum. Uh, and the other problem is that you may not be getting the insect at its microscopic stage and your vacuum isn't going to get into any, every crevice very well. Uh, and on top of that, vacuuming textiles is very complicated because you know a powerful vacuum can suck your textile right up. So you need to have it low power with some sort of cheesecloth or net over the end, which makes it very hard to suck up the moths in the first place. So I really don't recommend that as a first line. As a first line, I really just recommend sharp eyeballs and tweezers to take things off uh, and then freeze them after that. Okay, test the track of the starches. This includes paste, glue, paper, fabric starch, which everybody should think of as an enemy, the starch that people put in clothes. Um, if I could go back in history and, and get rid of it, I would. It should never have been invented. Um, so Fabric starch is what the cockroaches and the crickets like the most. Food stains and deposits, cardboard and canvas. Uh, so if you have anything made out of canvas, the canvas has been sized. It has been sized with a starch. Uh, so it's going to have deposits in it as well. So cockroaches, which again, I'm gonna assume you know what, to, what they look like. Silverfish and fire brats, we're gonna spend some time on termites and crickets. Now let's look at some bug pictures here. Okay, up here in the top left corner you see silverfish and fire brats. So how do you know the difference? Well, fire brats have a three-pronged tail like this. Silverfish don't. They have this sort of one long tail and it doesn't matter what size. Fire brats can get big, silverfish can be small. It doesn't really matter what color. Fire brats tend to be blacker, darker, but they can also be lighter and silverfish can be darker. It's very easy to get these two mixed up. Um, my advice to you is just decide that if you see anything that looks like this, that's bad news. And not worry about whether you have fire brats or silverfish, the treatment is about the same. Um, sometimes in the literature, you'll see them treated exactly the same. Um, and sometimes you'll see them treated differently, but for most collections, you just want to say, if I see these, bad news. So if you look down here, this is the damage from a silverfish infestation uh, on book pages. 
So for those of us that have uh, book and archival collections, paper collections, silverfish are very dangerous in book and paper collections. Uh, but if you think about it, what they're eating in book and paper is starch, is cellulose, uh, pulp, right? Uh, so that's what they're eating in textiles too. So it's very common to find silverfish, cockroaches, termites, especially if they've been in like historic buildings. If you have a historic structure that may have at one point had termites, then the chances that the things stored in that structure or exhibited in that structure have been exposed are higher. Uh, so they do the same things to textiles that they do to this book example. They just eat uh, and turn, they eat from the outside in uh, and create a whole lot of frass until you have uh, really nothing. You have this crumbling away material because it's been completely absorbed by the silverfish or the cockroaches or the crickets. Um, in textiles, I want to call some attention to things that are composite too. Like let's say you have uh, silk shoes with leather buckles or you have uh, a cotton dress with um, you know silk ribbons or whatever the case, things where you have combined materials. Those are the materials that are most likely to be infested at some point because all the bugs are attracted, right? It's like it's like the, the bug holiday in, they all want to come. And so Things like Native American indigenous collections that are often a combination of hide and feather and beadwork and maybe other fabrics that might be cellulosic, those are highly susceptible to infestations. Anything with fur on it, anything with fur on it is highly susceptible to infestation, even if the fur piece is small or an attachment or a medallion or something like that. Uh, you also want to think about things that are high sweat value, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, waistbands, headbands, collars, cuffs, um, underarms, crotches of pants, hems of pants, uh, anything that we're just going to have a lot of, of human sweat contact is also going to be uh, a place where uh, you're attracting pests in a composite environment. This uniform that you see over on the other side this one I pulled to show you what termites do. So this is termite damage uh, to a 1920s, if I remember correctly, uniform, band uniform. Uh, so if you can see all these little holes and bigger holes, and they tend to be, if you look sort of right here, you can see it tends to look sort of frayed around the hole. And then there's another layer of hole. And then there's another layer where they've eaten all the way through. That's what termites, cockroaches, silverfish tend to do on textiles. They eat in layers like a cake. So they'll eat the top layer and frass it, and then they'll go another layer down, and then they'll eventually cut through to the other side, uh, and then they go and find another spot. Because if they cut through the other side, that means like the good stuff is gone, so they're going to move somewhere else. But you can also see in this picture the places where you want to look. So this is a collar. So it's, you know, high high contact value here. It's also got, this is inside these seams, our collar stays uh, that are more than likely to be cardboard, which means that we are also attracting pests to that. Uh, and you have to think about things like collar stays and you have to think about things like um, stays in corsetry and things like that because they tend to be bone or cardboard depending on when they were made. Uh, so this is corrugated board probably in here or flat board, but you can see these insects, these termites are just following the seam line between them and the cardboard. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about the one treatment that I do think everybody can do, uh, and that's freezing. So I want to tell you, I'm, I'm a, a textile expert. I'm a museum director. At any given time, I have a freezer full of textiles that are waiting. Things that have been donated or things that I've purchased for collections that are going to spend 90 days in the freezer before, before we even do a condition report, before we even consider them part of the collections accession process. We're going to freeze them first. Uh, so what you want to do is three rounds of 30 days because the first freezing will kill any adult pests. Then you allow it to thaw 
and then the larvae will become adults and the eggs hatch. But because you killed adults, there are no more eggs. So then you freeze it for 30 days and you'll kill that batch. And then you thaw it out again and you allow that last egg stage to hatch. Then you freeze it another 30 days. So you have to do three freezes in order to catch the life cycle of that particular pest. If you only do one freeze or two, you're not going to be able to get it all. You've got to do three. Some insects have a slightly longer lifespan. Uh, so for instance, for a termite, it's really 40 days. So you might want to think about 40, 40, 40. Um, that's why it's important to know what you've got so that you can look up some specifics about lifespan uh, and how to arrest the stages. Some insects have like a 30, 35, 40 stage. Um, 30, 30, 30 is just a good basic rule to remember and it works 99% of the time. The way that you do this is simple. You take your textile, you put it in a Ziploc bag, you put the Ziploc bag in the freezer. Uh, any freezer will do. I am sitting on my computer at home. I have right now Guatemalan textiles downstairs in my freezer, in my kitchen. Uh, but I also have a locker freezer at the museum where some things are stored permanently. Furs are stored permanently down there. Uh, so you can manage this all sorts of ways. And if you have a small collection and you only have one or two things that you're worried about, you can just put them in a Ziploc bag and take them home and put them in the freezer and monitor them and then remove them and monitor them and remove them. Um, the other thing that I would say is that putting it in a Ziploc bag is really key here, putting it in a clear plastic bag, because then when you kill the adult pest, you will see them in the bag when you take it out at the end of its first 30 days. That way you can be sure what you've got, what you're treating for, and how extensive the, the infestation really is. Is it one adult or is it 50? If it's 50, you have a bigger problem than you did when it was just one. But having it in a clear plastic bag is the way to do that. Now, for those of you who are thinking, wait, I have a textile that's huge. It's a quilt. It's a rug. It's a bedspread. It's a tablecloth. It's gigantic. Uh, how am I going to freeze it and monitor it? Well, first of all, you're going to freeze it a little longer. Uh, and second of all, every time you take it out for another 30-day freeze, you're going to refold it in a different way or re-roll it the other direction or something like that so that you expose different parts to the highest, to, I'm sorry, to the lowest temperature, okay? It will still work out just fine. If you have uniforms that you need to freeze, and let's face it, World War I uniforms, since they're all wool, are terrible. Uh, for, for having pests, you have to really watch them. Um, if you have uniforms, all you need to do is lay it out fairly flat and put it in the freezer. If you've got pants, it's okay to fold them and put them in the freezer. The cold is going to penetrate the fibers just fine. You just want to put it in a Ziploc bag, squeeze the air out, shut it, put it in the freezer, and you can get Ziploc bags now these days large enough to cover just about anything. Uh, I have right now in my freezer at the museum a 15-foot Persian rug, and it is in a Ziploc bag. I had a Ziploc bag big enough uh, to contain a rolled 15-foot rug. Uh, so you can order them. You can even buy them at Walmart in pretty big sizes. Okay, so I also want to say if it's possible at all for you to store furs in a freezer, it's the best thing for mitigation. Um, you're not going to hurt them. But furs attract pests so easily. Uh, and now we're also talking about things like mice. I mean, furs attract pests so quickly and they um, can do so much damage to fur so quickly that you want sort of the highest level of safe storage for fur material. Uh, otherwise, you're just sort of opening up your collection to the possibility that it's going to get bad. Uh, so if you have, I mean, that's why people who have fur coats tend to store them in vaults. The vaults are, are below 40 degrees. Uh, so if possible, you want to store furs in the freezer. If that's not possible, then you want to store your furs together. You want to keep them all in one spot. I would recommend if you can keep them sort of away from other collections so that you can watch them more closely, even better. So you just want to sort of isolate quarantine furs as much as you can because they're going to be uh, highly problematic in the end. Um, 
Okay, let's talk about some damage that isn't pest. I bring this up because lots of people come to me and they'll say, you know, oh, I have terrible pest damage, yada, yada, and it's not pests at all. It's something else. And people are assuming it's pests because that's an easy assumption to make based on what you're looking at. Uh, so the first one there is shattering. This is about silk. Silk fabric, especially silk fabric made before about 1950, was treated with heavy metallic salt. Uh, and the result is that old silks shatter, which literally means that they disintegrate, that the warp and weft disintegrates due to the metallic salts. So this is a shaker hat from Stowe, Vermont, from the collection of Stowe. So you can see like, this is a hole. It looks as clearly cut and eaten as any hole we might look at. You can see these edges. Is, it has been, they look chewed. They're not chewed. This is silk shattering. Uh, and you'll know it's silk shattering if you see frayed ends, not frass. Remember that frass looks like powder. But if you see where it looks like, like right here, do insects eat in perfect squares? No. So if it looks like right here where you see a little bit of fraying, if there's still some thready pieces, some fraying somewhere, that's more likely to be shattering than it is to be insects of any kind. Uh, we don't see any holes here. We don't see any casings here. I'd almost be more concerned about this cellulosic basket part than I am about this, the silk. Next one is red rot. You can see I have a photograph here of red rot. Some of you who work in archives, you know what red rot is. Um, red rot is essentially a chemical reaction between leather and acid. So acid migration to old leather books. Um, if you've ever touched a leather book and you could come back with red dust all over your hands, this is red rot. Um, you can get that in textile collections too, because you can get like, I've dealt with saddles that had red rot. I've dealt with shoes that had red rot um, for a variety of reasons. And it can look, I mean, if you look at the surface of this book, it looks like there's trails and, I mean, you could easily go, oh, that's casing marks. Right, you can easily say, oh, those are, you know, bug trails, and they're not. This is red rot. Um, it can also, red rot can also fray the edges and eventually cause the loss of book binding. Uh, so the, the card that holds the book together will eventually just fall apart, especially here at the spine. Um, and people will look at it and go, oh, look, it's down to the thread. That's got to be insects. It's not. It's red rot. Um, and the telltale sign is this dust on your glove. Some people assume that mold is insects because they can be similar in color, they can be similar sometimes in, you know, in the way they look because they'll be sort of whole shaped, sort of, uh, you know, irregularly round and different colors. Um, that's really easy to figure out. If it's mold, you should be able to, uh, in any way, with whatever the easiest and least damaging way is, you should be able to scrape a piece of it off. And you should be able to put mold under a microscope you can't scrape insect damage off. Uh, so when you are looking at it, if it's something that you can smell or if it's something that if you touch it with your finger, it powders out, or if it's something that you can take, you know, for instance, uh, the end of the tweezers and, and scrape a little bit up, that's mold, it's not insects. Uh, inherent vice is just the damage that things go through over the life of an artifact, right? Artifacts were not made for museums. They were made for other purposes normally. Uh, so inherent vice is just the damage that comes to things over time. You want to think, for example, about you have a piece of pottery. The person who owned the pottery before they donated it, they broke it once and they repaired it with Elmer's glue, right? That's inherent vice. That's not insects. That's inherent vice. Now, it may look like there's a trail. It may look like things are powdering. It may look even frassy, depending on what kind of pottery it is. But it's not insects. It's Elmer's glue. It's the impact of starch and clay. Uh, so you want to think carefully about where things have come from. That's why a good condition report when it comes in is so important. So you can put the history of the, of the material too. Uh, ethnographic deposits, this is especially true in ethnographic or you know non-western collections indigenous collections um, anything that was in use and had a particular use and there's deposits from that left over that's not pests obviously uh, i have a very large bedouin collection we have about uh, 150 probably coffee pots and coffee roasters in that collection and almost all of the of the coffee pots have 
uh, some deposit that looks like dirt, but it isn't on the inside. It looks like frass. It's not frass. It's coffee, right? It's what's left over from boiling the coffee and the continued use of the pot has caused that to react to the copper of the coffee pot and you start to get this dusting up on the inside. It's ethnographic deposits, not bugs. Um, sunspots and bleach scarring. If you have ever seen in your collections at any time or somewhere else, a white textile with little brown spots everywhere, or, or one of your white textiles suddenly has brown spots everywhere and you're not sure where that came from, those are sunspots, also called bleach scarring. So what happens is that if you think about white clothing, and this is predominantly on white clothing, um, you think about people washing them in bleach, starching them, and then putting them on a line to dry, or putting them in the dryer to dry, and then starching them, or whatever the case may be. Um, you're creating chemically the perfect recipe for what are known as invisible stains. So bleach, the combination of bleach, starch, and sun, is a chemical combination, UV light, bleach, and starch, uh, that creates these invisible stains that are these brown spots. That's bleach scarring. Um, is there anything you can do about these brown spots? No, there is not. Um, don't try to wash it. You will actually make it worse. Uh, once a textile has brown spots, has bleach scarring, if you try to wash it or bleach them out or something like that, you will actually make more brown spots appear. You will propagate it. Uh, because you are compounding the problem by adding more bleach to this chemical issue. Uh, so if you have sunspots and bleach scarring, um, it is what it is, and you need to consider that part of the history of your piece. Uh, and the last one is spider webs, dust, and discoloration. Things get spider webs. That doesn't always mean you have a closed moth. Uh, if you find a spider web on something, take it out, put it under a microscope, check it thoroughly. If you're really worried, put whatever that is in the freezer and, and make sure there's nothing in the bag and it'll be okay. Uh, dust can sometimes crust on a piece, especially if it's been um, in storage for a long time. I'm dealing right now with a pair of World War II wool Navy pants uh, and they were in the veteran's closet since he left the service in 1943 on the same hanger in the same position. So it's got about 60 years of dust deposit along the top of the hanger. Uh, and that dust deposit now has crusted and then desiccated. And what that creates is almost like sticky dust um, across the top of the hanger. And when you look at it, it looks like frass. It looks like frass, but there's no holes to be found because it's not frass, it's desiccated dust crust. It's really strange. Um, because you don't normally have people leave something in exactly the same place for 75 years. Uh, but every once in a while, you'll get something like that. And then discoloration. You always have to keep in mind that textiles and collections, you don't know what all it's been through. Stains can come out over time. Stains can darken over time. Uh, colors can change over time. You can also have color migration. So let's say that you're storing um, a red dress next to a white dress and they're both from the 20s and you go in one day and the red dress is still red and the white dress is pink. The red has migrated because it can do that. Um, it can discolor other nearby pieces, um, especially if it's cochineal. So you have to watch out for discoloration, but again, that's not insects, that's not bugs. So something you don't have to panic about. Uh, monitoring. This is a sticky trap from a collection at Michigan, at the museum, at one of the museums at the University of Michigan. So you can see what's in the sticky trap, silverfish and or fire brats and a cricket. Uh, so clearly they've got some problems. Um, monitoring is key to this. So even if you can't go back and freeze every textile, and I'm not suggesting that you should, um, you can start monitoring now and see where if you have problem areas. So you want to try to keep textiles in white or off-white muslin, linen, cotton, or if you can afford it, Tyvek enclosures uh, or in Ziploc bags so that you can see pests more clearly. You want to create an environment where you can notice them. Uh, you can see how easy it is to see these silverfish against this white background. 
and you remember how difficult it was to see them clearly on other backgrounds in earlier slides. So the easiest way to monitor is to get a bunch of glue traps. You just get them anywhere. Get them at Walmart, get them at Lowe's, order them on Amazon, whatever you need to do. Uh, you just want, you don't need mouse sticky boards. You don't need glue boards. Um, I don't know how many times I've had to peel a glue board off a student's hand or off somebody's shoe. Don't get glue boards. Uh, you want these foldable cardboard glue traps for insects that you can get almost anywhere. And you want to place several of them in high traffic areas and you want to place them in areas where you know you have potential problem textiles, things that might be infested. Um, and then check them on a schedule. Check them once a week. Check them once a month. Uh, and that way, if you're checking them regularly, and you can just get yourself, you know, a spreadsheet where you know, I checked it on March the 15th, I checked it on March the 25th, I checked it on, you know, and you can go through and make notes if you see anything. If you don't, leave the trap because a clean trap is great news. Uh, but if you do, and chances are you will, then you know where you need to concentrate your efforts and looking more closely to see what's happening. Uh, and teach your employees to identify those top six. Be able to, you can just, you know, get a note card that your employees can keep in their pocket that's got all six on there and they can just look at it. Uh, I'm going to post these slides so that you can share it with them if you want to. You know, these are the six we're looking for uh, so that your staff can see them whenever they're happening. I had a cricket loose in the collections last year uh, and one of my student workers thought the cricket was cute and harmless and so she was just, I came in and she said, I don't know we have a pet cricket. And I said, no, we have a dead cricket, find that cricket. Uh, so you want to just teach them that these aren't necessarily, you know, innocent, cute things in the collections. You have to think about them differently. Uh, and then encapsulate textiles. When you get a textile donated, encapsulate it for 48 hours before you put it in collections. You don't have to put it in the freezer. Just put it in a Ziploc bag for 48 hours and watch it. Um, if after that 48 hours, you start to notice in the bag frass or what looks like dust, because that's what carpet beetles tend to create, dust, uh, or you notice dead adult insects in the bottom of the bag, then you know that that's a piece you likely need to freeze. Um, and 48 hours without oxygen in a bag is enough for adult insects, any of the types I've discussed, uh, is enough for them to start reacting. So if you have a problem, you'll know it in that encapsulated 48 hours. And then if you don't have a problem, then you would be okay conditioning it and adding it to your collection. Uh, and if not, then you know that you need to treat it. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes left. So time for questions. I'm going to turn off screen share in just a second. But you can see I've given you two internet addresses here, museumpests.net, which is the best website on earth pest identification. They have dozens of pictures and descriptions. You can find the life cycle information. Um, everything that you need is at museumpests.net. Uh, and it's constantly updated. It even, I don't know if it still does this, but it even used to have a hotspot map. Where go, you know, we're seeing high infestations of this and this and this because of the weather. Um, and the other one is museumtextiles.com. This is a, a study website for museum textiles, but they do have a section on pest damage and what to look for and how to manage it. So two resources that you sort of have at your disposal, museumpests.net and museumtextiles.com. So I'm going to stop the share. And does anybody have a question? Amber, there was a question in the chat earlier um, and okay. that was, the 30 30 30 freezing cycle how long do you allow the items to stay out of the freezer so that the insects can miss before putting them back in uh three to five days normally depending on what it is but three to five days for textile is normally long enough for it to thaw completely um, so that you're getting all the way down to the fiber level and making sure you thaw way down deep um, but it doesn't need to be more than five days and I would say that when you let it thaw, you make sure you're letting it thaw in its bag, right? We don't want to let it out. Just let it thaw in its bag. So depending on the thickness of the textile, somewhere between three and five. Small textiles will thaw out in 24 hours. Okay. Okay. Um, and I posted a picture over in the chat. I don't know if it's possible for you to open that up. Um, but this yeah, was an item from our collection. 
um, say, you know, we have a huge collection of textiles. Say you walk into this collection and you're new and you notice that there are some holes in things. How can you tell if this is pest damage or if it's new pest damage or something that happened a while ago, if there aren't good notes? Um, if you kind of just... Right. The only way to know if it's new pest damage or old pest damage is to encapsulate it for 48 hours and see if you have new problems. You encapsulate for 48 and you see new dust or you see new frass or you see new insects, then you know that infestation is current. Um, and if you don't, then the infestation is old and probably dead. And so what you need to do then is just clean it. Um, and that again is taking tweezers, picking things off. And if it's dust, then you want to go ahead and put a vacuum on low power, put a cheesecloth over the end of the hose uh, and vacuum the dust off, get the debris off. Um, and you know, I, I see lots of textiles where the damage is done, where, where the insects are already dead or have moved on, whatever the case may be. Um, and I'm always happy about it, but I always encapsulate it just to make sure uh, because you just, you just never know. Okay, I'm pulling up your picture. Oh. So you've got this Native American piece, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. And is the red leather or silk? Silk. Silk. I think what you've got is shattering. Um, and I can, you know, we've talked about me coming up there so I can take a closer look at it. But the fact that it's tearing away from the stitch line is a good sign that it's shattering. Uh, and then the fact that you can still, where it looks like there are lines where maybe the warp is coming out but the weft is still there or it's frayed, that is another strong indicator that it's shattering and not insects. The other thing is, if you had an insect that's eating silk, there's no reason it wouldn't eat the leather too, right? Because it's attracted protonaceous stuff. It's in a, if it's eating silk, it's going to eat leather too. And I don't see a whole lot of leather damage and I don't see any hole cuts. So if this is red silk, probably cochineal dyed and with a lot of metallic salt, it's going to break down pretty quickly from shattering. And I think that's what you've got there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, who else has questions? Yeah, you can just unmute yourself and ask. You can type your questions over in the side. Desiccated dust crust would be a great name for a band. I absolutely agree. <laughs> I'm an ethnographer too, so I write about heavy metal. So, being a especially good heavy metal band name, Desiccated Dust Crust. Anybody with a question? Well, while we're waiting, just in case, I want to give everybody my email. So my email is Clifford, just like the big red dog, C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D, at U-C-M-O dot E-D-U, U-C-M-O dot E-D-U. Um, if you ever have a question or something you're not sure about, something you need me to take a look at, I am happy to do so. And I don't mean happy to do so with a bill. I mean, I'm happy just to look at what you've got and help you figure out if you've got a problem or not. I also don't have a problem coming to your institution and looking at stuff if you need me to, just tell me. Um, I work for the state, so I don't have any problem coming around and doing whatever helps all of you the most. Uh, and you can always email me a photograph if you've got something you're worried about. You can just email me a picture and I can take a look at it for you. Um, I'm also, we've been doing these webinars, a few webinars about textiles, so I'm also wondering if you want another webinar about textiles, mo if there's a particular thing you might want it to focus on. Um, we did sort of basics of textiles last time. Uh, so we could do anything from build your own mannequin to storage for samplers to well, anything. We could do anything. We could do anything. Uh, so if you have an idea for a textile webinar, you might tell me that too. Do I suggest a certain freezer or any freezer? Any freezer will work. Any freezer will work. The, you just want to make sure that it's a freezer where the seal is good if you get a used one. Make sure that the seal is good, that when you turn it on and put the lid on or close it, that the seal seals the freezer. Otherwise, just like we know from freezers with food, you get what? Ice on the walls of the freezer. 
And the last thing we want is our textile collection in an ice, right? We don't want to expose them to water and ice. Um, all it would take is, you know, one, one little tear hole in one little Ziploc bag for you to have waterlogged pest infested wool and nobody needs that problem. So just make sure that the seal is tight. Uh, and then make sure that when you seal it for 30 days that you put tape on it or something like that so that nobody opens it. Um, otherwise, nosy people like to open museum freezers and kind of see what's in there. Um, I don't know what they're looking for, ice cream or something, I don't know. But yeah, you want to put tape and a date on it so that you can maintain. I, my freezer has a key uh, so that I can just lock it uh, and then come back down and unlock it when I'm ready to check on contents. So secondhand is fine as long as the seal is good. Anybody else with a question or a comment or a thought about future webinars or anything at all? Make sure I didn't miss anything. What kinds of cleaning supplies are we using might attract pests? Well, let's see. Um, that's kind of a tricky question because it depends on the chemical composition of the cleaning supply itself. Uh, and some cleaning supplies also off gas chemicals of textiles that can speed up damage. Like there are some cleaners that have a chemical in it that can speed up silk shattering if it gets exposed. And a lot of clean cleaners also have scents in them, right? To make them smell better. And usually those scents are, you can smell them because they're off gassing from the cleaner, uh, which means that they're off gassing into your collections too. Uh, so just to be on the safe side, I encourage you to use unscented or not scented cleaners. As lovely as honeysuckle might be, try to stay away from, from things that are artificially scented. Uh, and then really you wanna get the most natural chemical free, you know, it's a balancing act. To get rid of the pests, you want chemicals. For the safety of the collections, you don't want chemicals. So you've just gotta figure out where you're going to strike that particular balance with cleansers. Uh, if you go to that museumpest.net website, it also talks about cleansers and their long-term impact and what you should use and not use. Um, I can tell you that in my museum that what we do for cleaning in the collections area is quite frankly not a whole lot. Um, so we have, for instance, we have tile floors uh, and the university constantly wants to come mop and wax them and I say no, we don't want the floors waxed, no waxer, no mopping, we, no, we'll, we'll sweep the floors because nobody's eating off of them, right? So you just got to find a balance for your particular stuff, okay? Uh, and if you want suggestions about particular types of cleaning material, I can make those suggestions. Uh, so can um, the state has a hazardous materials website where you could go on to see if your cleaner has any hazardous or off gassing material in it. You can just type in the name of the cleanser and it'll tell you. Um, that's another good place to just sort of double check. Uh, and again, unscented if you can if you can do that. And I know right now in the time of COVID, we're all having to disinfect, disinfect, disinfect. But you're not disinfecting collections items. You're disinfecting public touch areas, right? Um, the truth is we don't know very much right now about the long-term effect of COVID on surfaces. There's still a lot of debate going on about how long it lives on a surface uh, and, and that sort of thing. Right now we're down to 24 hours. It lives on cardboard, uh, up to three days it can survive on glass and plastic. Uh, but nobody has done a test to see how long it lives on you know, an African feathered headdress. So you have to think about that. You're not disinfecting collections. You're disinfecting public use areas. So what I would advise right now in terms of quarantine is just to make sure that your visitors are maintaining a little bit of a distance if you have stuff that's outside of the case, right? If you have uh, artworks on walls, for instance, canvas artworks on walls, just, you know, maybe six feet from a painting wouldn't be a bad idea either, right? Just back everybody back up a little bit. Um, but cleaners look for some of those resources and again, stick with the unscented ones. Uh, let's see. Let's see, cleaning, a mannequin webinar, okay. 
and a webinar about how to support and store fragile objects. Okay. So maybe we need to do a webinar about custom storage solutions. So we can talk about storing fragile things, mannequin building, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, I think that Anybody sounds like a do? great idea. Okay. Well, that's the next one we'll do, custom storage. Wonderful. That's great. I'll go take some, I'll take some pictures of cool storage stuff. Thank you so much, Amber. It's always a pleasure to have you. Um, I learned a lot and I got to see some ugly bug pictures. So that's, that's, <laughs> that made my museum heart happy to, to, to know my enemy and be able to vanquish it. As always. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my um, pleasure. I hope everybody got something out of this particular one. I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did post in the comments the call for proposals for our upcoming MAMA conference. If you're doing great work and you want to share that, please uh, send us your proposal uh, for a conference presentation. That conference may be in person in St. Charles. It may be virtual. We don't know yet because, you know, nobody can predict the future right now with COVID. Um, I also put, put in the um, chat the upcoming virtual Show Me Missouri Museums and Archives um, information if you want to participate in that. Send your information over to Levi. He's coordinating that virtual programming series for us. Um, and then Friday, this Friday at 1.30, we're going to have Anselm Huselbergen, um, who is with the University of Archives on the MU campus, as well as Christina Miller, who's with the Missouri State Archives, um, coordinating our um, colleague conversation this Friday at 1.30. So it may have a little bit more of an archives focus, um, but they're just gonna be having a chat this Friday at 1.30. And then next Wednesday, uh, Candace Saul, who is the NAGPRA specialist at the Museum of Anthropology on the campus, campus of MU, is gonna be presenting about NAGPRA. So if you um, have questions about NAGPRA, she has a great presentation um, that she's going to share with us next Wednesday. And then Amber is going to put together, it sounds like to me, a, a, a custom storage solution webinar. Um, and so whenever we have that ready, we'll let you know um, when, when we're ready to send that out. So if you have any questions, feel free to keep putting them in the chat or, or jump on and talk to Amber, we'll be here. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the Missouri Humanities Council for sponsoring all of these wonderful webinars.